All right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Aaron Bresnahan, uh, Captain Retired U.S. Navy, and uh, here welcoming everybody to this um, live event that we have today. Um, be able to talk a little bit with the archivist of the United States, learn a little bit about uh, his background and what he's done. Um, but I definitely appreciate everybody joining us and really happy to have you here. Um, for those that are hopefully familiar with the Naval Order, I, and those that aren't, I just wanted to give a little bit of background as well of, of what the Naval Order is and what our history is. I mean, one of the things that most people don't know is that it's the oldest American uh, hereditary exclusively Naval Society. Um, it's dedicated to the interest of Naval history and it's encouraging its recording and preservation. Uh, provision for membership is based on lineal descent, ensuring strong continuing interest in the deeds and accomplishments of our forebears in perpetuity and our linkage to our predecessors forge a common bond uh, for responsible honorable service to our country so uh, we really appreciate those of you um, that have joined and are part of the naval order and uh, we're really excited to have you here with us as participating in this uh, live event for with the continental commandery which is a virtual commandery uh, serving members throughout the United States. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our guest. Um, his name is David Ferrio. He's the 10th archivist of the United States. Um, he was confirmed on November 6, 2009. Um, previously, Mr. Ferrio served as the uh, Andrew W. Mellon director of the New York Public Libraries, and he was part of the leadership team responsible for integrating the four research libraries and 87 branch libraries into one seamless service for users, uh, creating the largest public library system in the United States and one of the largest research libraries in the world. Uh, among his responsibilities when he was at the New York Public Library was the development of the library's digital strategy, which currently encompasses partnerships with Google and Microsoft and a website that reaches more than 25 million unique users annually. Uh, before joining the New York Public Library in 2004, Mr. Ferriero served in top positions at two of the nation's major academic libraries, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge and Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. In those positions, he led major initiatives, including expansion of the facilities and the adoption of digital technologies and re-engineering of printing and publications. Uh, Mr. Ferriero has a has earned a bachelor and a master's degree in English literature from Northeastern University in Boston and a master's degree from Simons College of Library and Information Science also in Boston. Um, after serving in the Navy, uh, where he worked for 31 years, uh, he was at MIT, uh, rising to the Associate Director for Public Services. So we're really excited to have him with us and uh, to be able to sh spend a little bit of time learning about what he does uh, for this nation and uh, having him share some of his insights uh, on history. So thank you once again for being with us. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to join you. All right, great. So um, again, we, we do have some questions that have come in from some of our members, our, our companions. And uh, so if you're okay, we can maybe just get started. Um, sure. One of the first things we'd like to know a little bit about is your time in the Navy. Um, sure. I know if you could share with us, that would be great. So as you said, I was an undergraduate at, at Northeastern University in Boston, and I was an education major and hated every moment of it. Um, this was in the late 60s and um, had a brother who uh, had joined the Army and was really happy as um, a member of the military services. So it got to the point where I was so frustrated that I um, decided to drop out and join the services. Um, my brother made it clear to stay away from the Army, um, that you'd be safer in the Navy. Navy had um, a great um, affinity, I had a great affinity for the Navy anyway. I grew up in Beverly, Massachusetts on the coast. Um, when I was growing up, Beverly was the birthplace of the American Navy. Marblehead seemed to have scooped up um, that title since since I left. But so the Navy and the and the ocean was always part of my my childhood. In fact, when I um, when we would go into Boston, um, 
visiting the Constitution, the USS Constitution was one of my favorite stops. And if you can look over my shoulder, there's a little glare on it right now, but there's a pen and ink sketch of the Constitution hanging in my office here in Washington. So I joined the Navy and um, it was during the Vietnam War. So I was of course concerned about my safety. Um, and I can distinctly remember on the um, enlistment form, a little box at the bottom where you could volunteer for hospital work. So I cleverly checked that box because I figured Navy hospital, that's pretty safe. And ended up being um, um, a hospital corpsman uh, assigned to a Marine unit in Vietnam my last year um, at, uh, in the Navy. So I went to boot camp at Great Lakes, um, trained as a um, hospital corpsman there also at Great Lakes, and then a specialty in um, neuropsychiatric hospital corpsmanship um, at Bethesda Naval Hospital here in Washington, and then spent um, a year and a half as the head corpsman on the psych ward at Chelsea Naval Hospital in Boston. So I was, I had, um, I had a uh, psych, psychiatry uh, specialty in, uh, in the Navy, which um, in terms of, of, of what I learned and what I took away from the Navy is, is a, a valuable set of skills that I use to this very day uh, in terms of interpersonal communication, the ability to listen, um, empathy, all those kinds of things that enhance the, the um, uh, normal human communication. Um, so got orders to Vietnam. Um, I got orders, it's very strange. I didn't have enough time in my enlistment. It was a four year enlistment. I didn't have enough time for field training and my orders were directly to the field. So picture this, uh, I get on an airplane in California um, in dress blues. This is in January of 1960, uh, 1970. Um, and the uh, flight um, stops in Okinawa where everyone except me gets off the, gets off the plane to get uniforms and equipment um, for then moving on to Vietnam. I, my orders were directly to the field, ended up in Da Nang, reported in, and they said, what are we gonna do with you? Um, since I hadn't had field training. Uh, I had orders then to the psych ward there at the Naval Hospital on the uh, first Marine Battalion headquarters and um, awaiting orders. What, what, the, what are they gonna do with me? Um, my orders finally came through and I was um, transferred to the USS Sanctuary hospital ship um, where the psych ward had recently been removed. Um, so I had um, um, worked in hospital personnel and then um, volunteered in triage where I had friends who, who um, I was stationed with in Ch at Chelsea Naval. So I had um, quite a, a, an interesting range of uh, responsibilities and experiences in, that way in the, in the Navy. One of the, I think one of the lessons that, that I took away from that whole experience, the Vietnam experience was a perspective. Um, you know, it's easy, especially these days, to think that the sky is falling and um, you're you're so wrapped up in what's going on that that you can't see clearly to the, a solution to a problem. And whatever, in my experience, in, in terms of um, and management and leader of staff, uh, my first question when we get into those kinds of tensions when people are feeling like that, my first question is. Is there a life at stake here? Um, let's put this into perspective. And that's a lesson that I brought back with me from Vietnam. So um, I can't say enough about, enough positive about my entire four year naval experience. The training was superb. 
Um, the medical training was superb. The psychiatric training was superb. Um, I can still do, I haven't done this in a while, but I could still do a suture. Um, so I, I'm pretty handy to have around. Well, it sounds like uh, the Navy had a real huge impact and grounding in your life and made a big difference. So we're happy to, to hear that story. Um, I guess one thing uh, that I'd like to follow up with, um, the next question would be, you know, how did you or how does one uh, become the national archivist? Um, keep your head down. And um, <laughs> it's very strange. It's not something that was ever on my radar screen. It was, um, you know, I was very happy as the director of the New York Public Libraries, never expected um, to to be in Washington, um, expected to retire from New York. And um, out of the blue, um, in April of 2009, I got a call from the White House saying that they were looking at me for this position, Archivist of the United States. And I, I was surprised and shocked and um, flattered. And this was on a Friday afternoon and, and um, said, I think you're looking at the wrong person, you know, that this is a presidential appointment. It's usually someone who the president knows or someone who's contributed a lot to a presidential campaign. Um, and it, it, this poor kid who was making the phone call um, asked if he could, if I would think about it over the weekend and he'd call back on, on Monday, uh, which he did. And we had the same conversation. And 10 minutes later, um, an adult from the White House called to say, asked if he could come to New York and talk to me, um, which he did that week. And it became clear in the conversation, in that conversation, that they were looking for someone who had technical background, had um, information management kinds of experience, large organization. Um, the New York Public Library was 2,500 people, um, 91, at that point, 91 different facilities. Um, uh, National Archives is 42 facilities with about 3,000 people, so scale is, is, is about the same. So um, after having that conversation, then um, I, it became clear that I had something to contribute. Um, I've always made my transitions from, you know, from MIT to Duke and from Duke to the New York Public Library based on my belief that I could make a difference. And it became clear to me in talking with the folks here in Washington that I had something to contribute. It would be a great honor to give back to the country. You know, I was certainly reminded of my naval service, my public service, and this was an opportunity to once again contribute to my government and my country. It sounds like it was a, definitely a humbling experience. So um, I guess you gave the right answer <laughs> and said yes. So that's great. Um, I guess one question uh, as a follow up. So as the archivist, what is it that you're actually responsible for? I mean, what is the job of the, the National Archivist? So I'm the head of an agency um, named uh, National Archives and Records Administration. So we're responsible for all the records created by the government. That means um, the 275 uh, departments um, within the executive branch. It means the records of Congress, and it means the uh, Supreme Court records. So it's all three branches of government in one way or another, we have responsibility. The, uh, my staff works with each of the records management staff in the agencies to ensure that the records are being created and maintained and transferred to us at the appropriate time. Um, um, so that means that um, all of the record keeping in across the federal government is managed, directed um, by um, our staff, our guidance, our um, two sets of laws, the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act um, dictate um, how that now how that whole process works. So we are now in, um, as I said, 42 facilities across the country, 17 states. 
Um, we are responsible for 14 presidential libraries, starting with Herbert Hoover in West Branch, Iowa, and going up to Barack Obama um, being created now in Chicago. All of the military records, anyone who ever served in the military, are in a facility in St. Louis, as well as all the personnel records of anyone who ever worked for the government in that facility also. Then we have regional records centers that have um, federal records from um, those areas of the country, federal district court records, for instance, are in facilities uh, scattered across the country. So that's um, kind of um, the spread of our, our responsibilities. Since we have the records, we're also responsible for um, uh, a, couple, a couple of other uh, responsibilities. The um, Information Security Oversight Office within the National Archives monitors all the classification activity across the executive branch. Um, our Office of Government Information Services helps people with their Freedom of Information Act requests um, of, the, of the agencies. And then we have a, um, a National Declassification Center that was established uh, in 2009 with the responsibility of reviewing for declassification um, all of the classified material going back to World War I. So there's a, a separate set of uh, responsibilities associated with uh, the record keeping. But if you ask me what um, the biggest challenges are um, and what, um, what my focus is, it's um, creating a all digital federal government, shifting the federal government off of paper into electronic record keeping. That's our major challenge. And that's, um, that's what makes the job exciting for me right now. Yeah, it sound, definitely sounds like it's uh, 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 overwhelming at times, especially with the probably the amount of paper that's generated. And I'm sure you have records that go all the way back to the founding. Uh, exactly. Well, and, and in fact, right down the hall from me are the Constitution, the, the Bill of Rights, and the original Declaration of Independence. So they do go back to the beginning. So is that, I guess, the, on the origin of the archives, then that was really, I guess, the, as you said, um, having to maintain the documents, having access. So um, when, when was it actually established, the archives? I think you can see over my uh, left shoulder um, the portrait of Franklin Roosevelt. It wasn't until Franklin Roosevelt's administration that we got serious about our records. There had been conversations from the very beginning about we should be doing something to protect and, and save our records. Thomas Jefferson himself wrote a wonderful letter from Paris in the late 1700s saying that we needed to do something. But it wasn't until um, 1930s that we actually got serious and uh, Roosevelt signed the legislation in 1934, um, hired the first archivist, hired the architect, John Russell Pope, to create this building in, in, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, and um, recruited and interviewed the, the, the first archivist, who then had the responsibility of creating a staff, trying to figure out where the records were, and, and kind of creating the whole records management process. So we were we were late in terms of our peers around the especially European countries. We were late getting started in the archival business. And, and when uh, I guess in the 1930s when the when it was first I guess it, like you said putting putting it together how how long is the appointment normally for the archivist? Or is there Limit or? It's, it's not there's no term limit on it it is um it's a presidential appointment but it has to be it can't be tied to an administration because of the nonpartisan nature of of the work okay thank you for that um you did mention uh the personnel records and the military records um you mentioned that they were stored in st louis so how how are those maintained or or are they, I guess, handled special in a special way? 
Um, they are treated the same way we treat all of our records in terms of protection and security and, um, and monitoring access. The, um, the records in St. Louis are, um, are used primarily by veterans or their families to guarantee the veterans benefits that are due to them. Uh, about 5,000 requests a day come in for verification, authentication of service and providing copies of the DD-214, the separation papers, um, to, to prove that an individual actually served in the military. And those requests are for to uh, authorize burials, military burials, um, uh, medical treatment, um, home loans for um, veterans, uh, housing for um, homeless vets, those kinds of activities. And that's, as I said, about 5,000 requests a day from um, that facility. Okay. I guess it was my understanding that I think back in 1973, there was a fire that broke out in that facility. Do you know how that's still affecting veterans today? Yeah, it's very, very sad. We lost um, between 16 and 18 million records, primarily World War II records. So um, it's, it, you know, it's interesting. I was uh, once on a flight um, coming back to Washington from, from somewhere, sitting next to a guy, and we got to talking, and he grew up in East St. Louis. And he said, uh, he was talking about, when he found out I was with the archives, he told about, talked about an experience he had as a kid. He lived close to the facility, and um, after the fire, the folks at the archives were giving out shoe boxes and asking kids to collect what, whatever kinds of fragments of records they could. So he was giving me, you know, his firsthand experience of having lived through that that process. So we have burned records. We have many burned records, and we have a wonderful, persistent staff there who are, um, you know, passionate about their work and passionate about providing whatever, what, uh, whatever information they can. But they have been able to reconstruct about 8 million records so far. And for those where the records, you know, have, they have not been able to do so, they knock themselves out trying to prove service for individual members, um, service members. So it's, it's a sad situation and something that um, I hope never happens again. We're very, very conscious of um, environmental conditions and safety, you know, of the staff as well as the records to ensure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, appreciate you sharing that. That's, um, I know there are a lot of people that are yeah, trying to do their best and we definitely appreciate those efforts. Um, I guess one thing that we also uh, know that according to the official form to request a record, it states that the Navy maintains records for, I guess, service members from about uh, January of 1995 until the present. So at what time does the National Archives take control of those records or will the military branches always control records? So the, um, the Navy was the first to switch to electronic record keeping service records. Um, and then the, the other branches followed, followed suit. And it's, um, they will be retained by the, by the services, who they are agencies. Um, for 62 years before they're transferred to the National Archives. So they will eventually end up here. Okay, thanks for that. Um, does the Archives have any intention to digitalize all the records of the military and veterans of the United States? And when do you think that will be completed? Not in my lifetime. Um, it, is, uh, it is a great desire on my part. We have... Um, I didn't, we didn't talk about numbers of records, but we have in our custody about um, 15 billion, billion pieces of paper and parchment and 43 million photographs and miles and miles of film and video and about 6 billion electronic records. And it's my goal, um, and we've 
stated it in our strategic plan, uh, my goal to digitize everything that we have in our holdings to make it easier for people to get the information that they need. Not only veterans, but people who are are searching for information about how decisions were made or, or about our history. The archives was created so that the American people could hold their government accountable for its actions and learn from the past. And the way to do that is to be able to actually see the original records that document how decisions were made. So my goal is to make that possible from your home 24 hours a day. Um, as I said, um, I will never live to see that, but that's the, that's the trajectory that we're on now to digitize as much as we can. Yeah, it sounds like it's a, a monumental task, but yes. as you said, uh, hopefully it'll be done and very accessible uh, sooner. Um, so I guess one curiosity, uh, because you have so many, so much access in all the documents and everything that's there, um, what do you think would you could describe as your most favorite document in the archives or thing, something related to the Navy that maybe people don't know about or, or might be curious about? Um, well, as I said, we have, um, um, I have this, this personal connection with the old Ironside USS Constitution. And I was delighted to learn when I got here that we have all the Navy deck logs, including the deck logs for the Constitution. So we've had um, visitors, crew from the Constitution come and visit and um, read from the deck logs about the the, the incident with the Guerriere, for instance. And um, so the Constitution debt logs are certainly the one of the Navy records that I would point to as, as being very special. But in terms of, of other records that are especially important to me, when I became the archivist and met with the directors of the presidential libraries for the first time, they went around the room and introduced themselves and the director of the Kennedy handed me a copy of a letter that a kid wrote to the president asking for information about the proposed Peace Corps. And it's a letter from me, um, which I you know, remembered being interested in the Peace Corps, but I didn't remember writing the letter. And that led to the other directors going back and searching their files and discovering that they had um, found, they found two letters from me to President Eisenhower and one letter from me to President Johnson congratulating him for signing the Civil Rights Act. So those letters to the president, those are records, those are presidential records, um, are saved and, um, and can be retrieved. Um, so if you're watching and you haven't written a letter to your president, do so because someday you can go to the Trump Library and read your letter. So, so those type of documents are held at the presidential libraries. So that it would be something that you could go and, as you say, visit and, and request. That's right. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I guess another question, uh, I know you're heavily involved with the National History Day, and I know that um, there's a lot of also students that are listening to this and, you know, high school and different ages of uh, students that are that are listening. Is there anything that you could tell us about the National History Day or how the process works or what you could do to encourage people to participate in the, the National History Day program or the local state programs? We're a huge supporter of the, the concept of National History Day because it's an opportunity to encourage the use of our records um, in, in, in the uh, competition for um, National History Day status. So we um, host lo the local competition for the District of Columbia. In, we also um, host in Philadelphia um, National History Day uh, activities. And there, we actually have National History Day activities in many of our facilities. We work very closely with the schools, um, the teachers, the history teachers, social study teachers, um, to encourage them to use our resources. We do teacher training, student training in our facilities. 
Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that we also give um, two prizes at National History Day competition for, three, for national winners. So we're, we're huge fans and supporters of National History Day because it's one of those ways to get kids, especially young students, excited about doing research and learning more about their country. I guess uh, students are able to, I guess, have any kind of topic that they feel personally um, energized about. I know the Naval Order is also a very big supporter of the National History Day program and the and the state competitions. We actually sponsor quite a few as well. Right. Um, is there any topic or anything that would come to mind that maybe needs a bit more research or something that might be interesting for students to look into? Um, well, I would uh, I would encourage since the Navy since you mentioned the Navy's um, interest in National History Day, I would like someone to do some you know really serious research around the birthplace of the American Navy and settle the score for once and for all. <laughs> all right, that sounds good. Well, like you said, Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts had a lot to do with those early days. I think even, uh, I guess, rowing across the Delaware when George Washington was attacking Trenton. All right. Well, it, it, and, and the reason the crew came from Marblehead, the ship, the Hannah, was in Beverly Harbor, um, owned by, actually owned by someone from Manchester, Massachusetts. The Hannah was the first ship George Washington outfitted. So that's why when I was growing up, Beverly was the birthplace of the American Navy. There are now five five spots in the United States that claim to be the birthplace. So that's why I think it's a, a ripe research topic. Well, it definitely sounds like a challenge. So hopefully someone will take that up uh, sooner rather than later. Um, as uh, to talk a little bit more, I guess, about your role, um, one of the thing, one question that came up is what the role of the archivist is in relation to the electoral um, college. And obviously, being an election year, um, there's a lot of uh, interest in how that whole process works. Could you talk a little bit about that? We administer the process. Um, so we're, we communicate, we set the date for the electoral college to convene. We, sh we work very closely with the secretaries of state across the country to um, establish the, the ground rules and the date and the process by which they report back um, to the outcome of the electoral, their electoral college vote. Those are submitted um, in paper um, to me um, and they are then processed by our Office of the Federal Register, which is part of the National Archives, tallied and sent up to the Hill. We have no role in, um, in other than administrative in, in terms of the process. And I suppose there's a very straight timeline on how, on how that works. I mean, we have election day and then the electoral college process starts. Is How does that timeline work? Or is there a certain number of days it has to be completed? Um, not by law, but it's usually um, the um, December is when it convenes. The first meeting is um, in December, I believe, after the election. That's when the eight, an early December date is set, and then they have to be in, I believe, by the end of the year. But it, um, if you go to archives.gov and search Electoral College, you'll find all the details. All right, great. Now, I'm sure our students online will start Googling that as soon as possible, especially being in an election year. Yes. Um, are there archivists in each state, or is, how, does this, how does that work? There are state archives also. So every state has um, a, a state archivist who reports usually to their secretary of state. That's usually the reporting structure for um, state archives. They're not part of the federal government. Um, I um, meet with them um, on a regular basis 
and we share information about best practices, but they do not report to the, um, the National Archives. They report directly to their states. We're all dealing with the same kinds of issues in terms of this transition from paper record keeping to electronic record keeping, which makes the need for communication and sharing best practices all the more important. No, that's glad that was clarified. I know when I visited the archives, you know, you always have the uh, the temperature and light sensitivity on some of the really old documents, and I'm sure those are, you know, those are probably some of the more complicated things that you have to deal with as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. I guess what about, um, especially through this COVID price, um, process that we've been dealing with COVID nineteen? There's been a lot of people that have been um, hunkering down and, you know, stuck in their homes for quite a while, but, you know, we're starting to open up the country a little bit now, but is there um, anything that people can do from an educational process, especially with a lot of the students, you know, not being in a classroom environment, but they're either working from home. Is there anything that people could think about um, that they could utilize the archives for um, during this, this trying time that we're in? Sure. I would, I would encourage you to go to archives.gov and take a look at all of the things that we have available now for, um, for education-related materials. Um, we do uh, a lot of, as I said, teacher training and, and work with uh, classes to develop curricula. Um, we have something called Docs Teach, which has thousands of primary sources that um, have been uh, selected by teachers from around the country and by our education staff who have developed curriculum based on our primary sources. Um, and then there are um, regular virtual learning modules that are pre uh, presented each week um, by the central education staff and by our presidential libraries. Each one of the presidential libraries has a very active um, education program. So I would encourage you to go to archives.gov and, and take a look at all the resources that are available. All the more important in this, um, in this period when schools are closed and um, homeschooling has, has taken on new meaning. Um, we're very proud of the the resources that we've made available. Uh, great for sharing that. And again, I encourage everyone in our commanderies, uh, even I know we have a lot of authors in our group and a lot of people that are writing uh, articles. So I'm sure it'd be great for them to be able to dig into those, those documents. Um, I guess one thing, especially now that we're in the time of uh, the census, uh, do you or does the archive have a role in the process of the census, um, getting information or maintaining uh, records related to the census? We um, we deal with it after the fact. So we are preparing for the the release of the 1950 census. Um, so we're um, making sure that we have all of our um, records digitized and organized in a way that we'll, we'll be able in April to release the 1950 census. And what, I mean, how does that release happen or how do people, what, I mean, is it, is there a big, it's all, it's all, like, it's all online. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess that would be all, everything, all the questions that are asked and all the information, it's completely open to the public at that point. Yeah. Um, will it be um, available? I mean, it, you said in April, but I guess has the date been fixed yet? Or no, no. Okay. So, uh, and I can guarantee you that um, because we've been shut down for so long, that it, it's going to be. It may be. It may be delayed. Okay. Um, what do you think? is the most important document our nation lost before the archives was established? That's a good question. Um, and it's something that I've thought a lot about, but I don't have an answer for that. Um, uh, it's, it's a miracle that what has survived has survived. 
when you think about, I think about the charters every time I walk through the rotunda and just realize that they were created in Philadelphia. The, the capital moved from Philadelphia to New York. They were dragged to New York and then dragged here to Washington. And then um, the War of 1812, the British burned the town. The charters were at risk. They were at the State Department. And the night before the British burned the town, a clerk in the State Department, Stephen Pleasanton, realized that the charters were at risk and he rolled them up, stuffed them into linen sacks, commandeered a wagon on the street and took them into the hills of Virginia. And that's the only reason that they are sitting in the rotunda today. So I often think about what else, what was lost, what was lost during that fire, what was lost because there weren't, you know, official record keeping um, processes in place. It's just a miracle that what has survived has survived. The Oaths of Allegiance signed at Valley Forge by George Washington and his troops are here. And it's just a miracle that that they were um, they were saved, they were protected, and they were um, they were recognized at that from the very beginning as important documentation. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, especially as you say, with so many fires and so many troubles that we've seen over the years. Um, I'm glad we're doing our part as a nation to preserve that for. For the future generations. Um, what is the archive doing to prepare for the future? Um, I, you mentioned a couple times already the digitizing of the, the records, but is there something else that uh, people would be interested to know about for things, initiatives that you have for the future? I think that the, um, as, I, as, as we talked about earlier, the, uh, my goal of digitizing everything that's, that we have in our custody, I think is huge. And I think that's um, what we are so focused on. We have um, you know, several special projects that are going on um, thanks to some special funding. Um, we have um, a separate congressional funding to do recently um, authorized to digitize uh, Navy and Coast Guard vessel deck logs for ships that served in and around Vietnam. Um, it's called the Blue Water Navy Initiative um, to deal with Agent Orange request um, uh, authorization. Um, so there's, there's um, s these special digitization projects that are helping us in, in my goal to digitize everything. Another um, area where we've um, been able to get special funding is um, Native American treaties. And the United States has something like 375 treaties with Native American nations. Um, these are wonderful, wonderful documents. Um, most of them, all of them on parchment, signed by government officials back to um, Timothy Pickering and George Washington's time um, and, and, and by the Indian elders. So we have digitized, we, we have digitized about half of them at the moment and they're, they're on our website. These are among the, the saddest documents in our custody because they point out, um, they document all the promises that were made to these uh, Indian nations in terms of financial resources and schools and, and hospitals and, and water rights, land rights that were never, never delivered on. And they're heavily used, still heavily used by Native American tribes. Um, we have visits from tribal lawyers and tribal elders um, to you know, read the original language. So having these um, available um, in digital form is, is going to um, meet that need. So continuing to um, make as much of our content accessible as, as possible. 
<laughs> okay, great. And I guess a little bit of a follow up on that is, do you see that the role of social media is having a big impact on how the archives or what we need to archive or how we see like, communication and what needs to be retained? Is that posing challenges? It's huge. Or? It's huge. Um, and I, I think that's um, one of the most interesting, exciting and um, nerve wracking aspects of collecting electronic information. The landscape is changing very quickly um, uh, and being able to capture for the long haul um, social media content is one of our biggest challenges. So we have, um, we got uh, about eight years of experience in the previous administration with tweets. So we have the Obama tweets, but they um, pale in comparison in terms of numbers to the tweets from this administration. So keeping up with, with those is, is, um, is quite a challenge. But also every agency now is using social media in one way or another to communicate with the American public. So providing guidance for those agencies and what they need to do to ensure that we're keeping um, the, the records, um, the social media form records the same way that we um, did in a, a paper format, which means that in order to do that, it means a shift um, in terms of focus on the information technology infrastructure of the federal government, which needs needs to be adequate and up to uh, keeping up with uh, all this electronic content that's being created. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a major challenge and uh, I guess getting it right so that we're retaining for posterity right. the, the important things. I guess one thing that as a follow up on the, the digitizing, um, I know sometimes when I think of the government, I, I think of the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, warehouse where you know there's just rows and rows of boxes i think i guess i'm wondering is do you still have to maintain the paper document even though you digitize uh so far yes <laughs> but but let me tell you that is certainly a conversation that's going on <laughs> yeah i can imagine it's uh, one of those other headaches and challenges right we want to make sure that um this content is in um, is safe, secure, can't be altered, can't be destroyed. Um, so um, it's more complicated in an electronic environment than it has been in paper. Absolutely. So um, do you believe that the role and the purpose of the archives has lived up to the expectations of what the founders would have really wanted for what we do? I mean, even though some of the legislation has been going back to the 30s, do you think uh, we're living up to that, to the expectation of the founders? I think, I, I think Thomas Jefferson would be very pleased to see um, how we have responded to his call for taking care of ensuring that the uh, uh, records were collected, protected, and not only um, uh, housed and, and taken care of, protected, but that the American people have been encouraged to use those records. That was that was clear in his message in that letter from Paris. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, it's always nice when you feel like you have a purpose that means uh, is doing. You know, you're living up to that expectation, and people appreciate it. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience or any final words um, or any encouragements for those that have been participating with us? Well, I hope each one of you has an opportunity to come to Washington and visit the National Archives once we're open again. Um, we have a, a, a tremendous um, exhibit space where we show samples of, of documents uh, that are in the in the records of the country. The rotunda holds, as I said, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. Each one of those is kind of a jaw-dropping experience to stand in the presence of those documents, those words that launched this country and are still so meaningful to all of us. And we have a permanent exhibit, um, as I said, with samples of our records. And then there's always a, 
a temporary exhibit, and we're now commemorating the passage of the 19th Amendment, women getting the vote. So there's a wonderful exhibit on that. And then downstairs in the Rubenstein Gallery, David Rubenstein Gallery, we have a records of rights gallery where we talk about immigration, civil rights, and um, women's rights. So there's a lot to see, and I hope you will come and visit. Well, we definitely appreciate that invitation, and uh, I just want to thank you very much. Um, we've been speaking now for the past um, almost hour with David Ferriero, the 10th uh, archivist of the United States. It's been extremely uh, educational for me. I've definitely learned a lot about how the archives work. I've learned a lot about how the Navy records are taken care of. <clears throat> We've definitely learned a lot about the resources available <clears throat> and what we can do uh, for research and to be able to be able to, to learn even more about our country and to be able to benefit from what those have done uh, on our behalf in the past. So I definitely encourage everyone to please uh, visit archives.gov and learn more about those critical documents. Um, we also hope people will uh, continue to learn more about the Naval Order of the United States and what we're trying to do to promote uh, the history of the sea services. Uh, we definitely encourage um, people coming together and talking and learning, and especially about the history of the Navy. Uh, we did get a very uh, clear challenge to, to once and for all put to bed where the birthplace of the Navy was and when. Uh, so we definitely thank you for that. And, um, I, and just thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us uh, on this on this day. And um, again, hope hope we can get to visit the uh, the archives as soon as the country is fully open and uh, to learn even more. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe. You as well.